Hi, welcome to Transform Life Church. In a moment, you'll be joining the service already in progress. If you're joining us for the first time, I'm glad that you're here with us. I pray that today's message will be a blessing to you. So don't go anywhere. I'll be back at the end to share some next steps with you. So, I've been away for a while with my wonderful wife, Joan, who has escaped. And it was a very good time. So, as I started to process what I would say this morning, we asked the Lord. I said, Lord, what would you want me to speak about? And the morning that I asked that, I went and I read a passage out of First Chronicles 21. And the Lord said, speak from this passage. And, and I want to hear that when God tells you something like that, that means that there is one or more. Most times there are many people who hear, need to hear this message. And then when I heard what the gentleman had spoken about when I was not here, did they do well? These guys just really, 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 really were excellent. Um, I realized that, that this is the word of the Lord to us. And the, the passage is a long passage, so we're going to narrate parts of it, and we're going to just read parts of it. But I want you to listen to what the Spirit of God would say to you this morning about yourself. And... The passage begins by setting the context for the passage. It says this, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to do a census of Israel. Now, to do the census for David was a sin. And Satan wanted to damage Israel. He wanted to bring a curse on Israel. He wanted to destroy Israel. And it's obvious that he could not do it on his own. It was not that he could automatically do it. So what he did was he incited David to sin. How many people know that sin has consequence? That sin brings a curse. So he incited David so that when David did the sin, the consequence of the sin, because sometimes, you know, the enemy goes up and accuses us before the Lord so that the Lord brings the consequence of the sin on us. And, and he did this, and David... I want you to hear that David is an experienced man of God. So David would have known if it were just some kind of frivolous temptation. However Satan did this temptation, it must have made sense to David in the beginning. He never recognized it fully that it was a sin. I want you to hear that sometimes when the Lord wants to to, to bring damage in your life and bring a curse in your life. He Just checking if you're listening. <laughs> I'm lying. That's not true. Anyway, I'm repenting. I did repent. Did repent, wife. Did repent. <laughs> Sometimes when Satan wants to bring a curse in your lives, he gives a temptation that seems reasonable. If you're not discerning you don't understand that this is really a temptation. It is for your demise. And, you know, not all that glitters is gold. And he, he brings it so that we can bear the consequence of it. So David never understood, did the thing, and it was a sin. And lo and behold, it brought a curse. And the curse brought a consequence. And God told David that he has three choices for the consequence. He said, you can go under a number of years of oppression of the enemy. I can lock up the skies for a number of months, or I can bring a plague on Israel. And David chose the plague. And the plague tore up Israel. The hand of the Lord was heavy on Israel. And, and 70,000 people died. I want you to hear that the consequence of your sin don't affect you alone. It sometimes affects your children, your neighbors, your church, your, your workplace, sometimes even the nation. Some of what we are going through as a nation is a consequence of our forefathers' sins. It's not only what you see now. It is boiling down. And this caused the, 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 
the plague caused David turmoil. And David was repentant. And David went to the Lord and said, David said to the Lord, Am I not the one who, call, who called the census? I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. These people are as innocent as sheep. What have they done? He started to repent before the Lord. And let me tell you something. The Lord loves a repentant heart. The, the Lord just loves when we turn in repentance. So God spoke to the prophet God. And, and God went to David and God told David exactly what to do so that the, the, the plague could be stopped. God said to David, go up, build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So immediately David got up. He went to Aruna and he explained to Aruna what was going on. I have seen the Aruna, Aruna the, 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 the plague has come upon Israel and the Lord has said, I must use your threshing floor to create the, the, the solution. I must sacrifice on your threshing floor. And Aruna, understanding that he's part of the nation, and under, no, David said to Aruna, so let me give you the, the, the verbiage for that. He says, let me buy this threshing floor from you at its full price. Then I will build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. So on hearing the request, Aruna, as a conscious man of the society and recognizing that David is the king, said to David, don't worry about it. I will give you the threshing floor. Not only that, I will provide you the oxen, I will provide the wood for the fire, I will provide the wheat for the fire. You are set up. Because it is free to you. Would you take that? Would you take it? It would expedite the process. It would make life easier. It would happen quickly. The plague would stop quickly. You see, many of us might take it, but but to Aruna's surprise, David says, no, I am insisting on buying it for full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. Tell your neighbor, I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. David says, I insist on paying. No, 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 no. I will not present birth offerings that cost me Nothing. I want to tell you something. True worship is going to cost you something. Tell your neighbor that. True worship is going to cost you. No, man. I'm not telling you no energy. I go away. I'm going to come back. And I know. No, man. Say to the next neighbor. True worship is going to cost you something. So David paid Aruna 600 pieces of gold in payment for the threshing floor. And David built an altar there. To the Lord and sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And when David prayed, the Lord answered by sending fire from heaven and burnt up. My goodness, it's sweet, the Lord. Can you imagine? The man is in sin. But when he's repentant and respond properly, it's sweet, God. How many people want to say fire just burn up all them sacrifice? That God will let us say, my God, look at my son and look at my daughter. My goodness, I'm going to send fire. <laughs> Crazy. You remember, I've seen him coming out of. But when he respond right to God, God is pleased with him. Then the Lord spoke to the angel and said, um, um, spoke to the angel who put the Sword back in his sheath. When I read this, I just, I just recognized that David understood God. He understood spiritual things. He understand how, how the spiritual realm works. You see, if he had accepted Aruna's sacrifice, the sacrifice would be done, but God would not be pleased because it didn't cost him nothing. A cheap sacrifice. God is not into cheap. If he had a... Everybody with me? God is not into cheap. You see, the issue is that your faith requires something from you. 
you must be actively engaged. You have to have some skin in the game. It is not a passive thing. You can't just sit down and make it happen. You have to put yourself in it. If, if David had taken it, he would, have, he would have been spiritually passive. We call it spiritual passivity. You see, here's a lesson. As Christians, we are not called to easy passivity, but rigorous activity. You see, if you say you're a believer and your, your faith is not costing you anything, something wrong. If you're not pressing against something, if you're, not, if you're not pressing forward, if you're not defending attack, if you're not defeating some temptation, if you're not even just standing as a man of God against the evil forces of this world, if you're not doing nothing, something is likely to be wrong. And spiritual passivity, I believe, is a, is a big challenge today. And passivity always is a very powerful and dangerous and destructive enemy. The Lord does not only want us to stand against oppression. He wants us to push back the oppression. He wants us to back up the enemy. He, he, it cannot be that we just utter us. Anything happen. You know, case Sarah, Sarah. David sinned, but David decided that it would not end this way. I am going to defeat this thing. I'm going to conquer this thing. That is why David is a great king. David recognized that he was at war. He was at war with his neighbors, but he was at war spiritually. I want you to hear if you are a believer in the house, you are at war. There is no Cree in this war. Anybody know Cree? Right? There is no Cree in this war. You can't settle Cree. Satan, I soon come. Give me a break. We cannot allow passivity to take away the good things that God wants us to enjoy. But we have to face a challenge. We live in an era where people emphasize the non-essentials and are passive about the essentials. The things that are supposed to occupy our lives. We easy. And the things that are on the outskirts, the frivolous things, we spend a lot of time on that. And when sometimes I see what is happening in Christendom, it, it, it's frightening to me. We want to take what other people give us and offer it to the Lord in a way. A number of years ago, I went to a prayer meeting um, by a friend and at this prayer meeting, she always prophesies. So she said, I'm going to teach you how to prophesy. So she called me up with her, and I'm going to work with her and prophesy over some people's lives. No problem. I'm willing to learn. So I go up, and something happened in the meeting. Somebody came up to us, and something happened in the meeting, and she had to stop the meeting. So I'm just here talking to this lady. So I said to her, hey, you come to prayer meeting often? She said, every time the prayer meeting, whole, I am there. So I said, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> so I said, so, you know, what, what do you come here for now? She said, every time the prayer meeting come, we come for a word. Okay? So, how long are you a Christian? Ten years. So I said, ten years? I said, do you know that you can read your Bible for yourself and pray? And you can get a word from God so that you can confirm the word that you, somebody speaks to you. Say, Lord of mercy, we can't tell you the last time we pray. We can't tell you the last time we read my Bible. Somebody say, yea, thus says the Lord. <laughs> Go and read thy Bible. Because <laughs> me don't tell her no. Me not prophesying over you. You see, anyhow you depend upon a word the enemy have you like like ping pong ball. You must have the word inside you. So that when the word comes, you say, yes, this is from the Lord. Or no, who are not? Because people who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. In other words, it is a proof that you are a child of the king. That the Lord talked to you. When I talk about here, if you're talking, you can't talk through the word if you, know, if you don't have that kind of, you know, receptivity. It's amazing. I see it all the time. A man in trouble. 
a woman in trouble, and they won't even pray for themselves. They want somebody else to pray for them. I will not give to the Lord that which cost me something. Me must have some skin in the game. I'm not saying that people can't pray for you now, but me must be down on my knees too. Because my situation, God is nothing to cheap. Tell your neighbor, God is nothing to cheap. And anything will not cost you something is going to overrun you. Sometimes it's a temptation. And we know we're being tempted, but we start to say, oh, yeah, it's going to kill you. Sometimes it is a spiritual discipline that we're not doing. We're not reading our Bible. We're not praying. Anyhow, anyhow you go passive panic. Satan is going to overrun you. Sometimes it's a sin. You're in the middle of it. You know it's a sin. And you just start to easy with it. You start to flirt with it. Satan is going to kill you with it. Sometimes a spiritual battle. And God said, if you don't just hold up your hand in the ear and call on the name of God, he will come in on your behalf. But not even. We cannot afford to be passive. We cannot afford for passivity to rob us of the glory of God and the victory that Jesus secured. Jesus, the holy feet. The reason why the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The devil is already destroyed. Amen. What we are doing now is that we are defeated. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. When we're going through some stuff, a lot of times it's easy to avert. Or sometimes you have to press through for a long time. Seven times in Revelations, God says he blesses the overcomer. God love an overcoming spirit. Him love somebody who will not take no. Him love somebody all when it look dark and them still oppressing. He says to the overcomer, I will bless you with access to the tree of life. I will bless you that you will rule over nations. I will bless you, I will bless you, I will bless you. But the person who is lukewarm, God says, I will spew you out of my mouth. And there sometimes, you know, there are some scriptures, right? You just say, Nick. <laughs> what does that mean? And I want to give you some examples of how spiritual passivity has destroyed lives that were meant to shine. So open your resource, let's start to write them down. First one is Adam in Genesis. Adam was the first man God created. And it is obvious that Adam and God were tight. The scripture indicates in, uh, in, in, um, that God used to come down and talk to Adam. Adam had dominion over the earth. God says, have dominion over the earth, animals, and everything. Then Adam, God gave Adam Eve. So Adam had dominion over Eve. No, but I make it soak into the, the females in the house. And we know the story that Satan came and tempted Eve. Satan told Eve about the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Told Eve that if she ate it, she would learn, grow, be like God. Eve took the bait. She ate the fruit. What happened when Eve ate the fruit? Nothing happened. Nothing at all. Everything remained the same way. Now, Adam was the one in dominion. Let me just read that scripture to you. Adam was not the one who was deceived. It is the woman who was deceived. So when Eve ate the fruit, nothing changed. So when she carried the fruit to Adam, Adam had all the authority in the world to say, woman, or let me not, let me be clear. <laughs> Baby love Eve. <laughs> make me wait till God come. And make me ask him, how am I to handle what you are doing right now? Adam should have stood on his authority and said, no. 
As a matter of fact, when you read Numbers, it's Numbers 30. Read it for yourself. It seems as if Adam could have counteracted what Eve did. In Numbers 30, it says, if a man has a daughter and the daughter makes a vow and the father is not in, 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 in agreement with the vow, the father can cancel the vow. So Adam should have taken it up and said, Satan, where you go? Come out in Jesus' name. I cancel his vow and I take back my wife. But spiritual passivity. Instead of standing up in his authority, him low it. And the whole of us have been suffering since. So we can't wait to see Adam, you know. <laughs> anyway. Write this down. Spiritual passivity can result from not taking spiritual, taking spiritual responsibility. Men in the room, you are the covering for your wife and your family. That's just a raw truth. If, if you are female in the room and you feel away, take it up with the Lord. <laughs> That's what the scripture says. He should hold the standard. And I just go to a course and I learn anytime the man does not hold a standard in the house, all kind of things go wrong. The children are rebellious. The children are angry. Some of the children are slow learners. And they have functional disability in making other relationships. And women, sometimes we have to back down so the man can step up. Women. Sometimes we have to step down so that the man can step up. Amen. Why, everybody? <laughs> Women, <laughs> I'm appealing to somebody to agree with me. <laughs> Parents, we have spiritual responsibility over our children. And nowadays, we have reached a point where the children are running things. Yeah. It's like a afraid that we pick them. Yeah. I want to do this and I want to do that. And the parents are not holding. Mm. Look here. They are not your friends first. Amen. They are not your friends first. Amen. You are the parent. Some of the children are suffering all kinds of issues because of passive parenting. I have a cousin. His mother died and his father remarried. And it, it was hard for him, you know? And him get rebellious. And him just get out of hand. When mom was about 14, he was a big 14. He said one night him coming from wherever him was, right? And him said, coming is a passage. Him coming and all him sees a dark figure running towards him, right? He's him father. <laughs> him father put it on. <laughs> no, I'm not advocating abuse. Everybody understand what I say? <laughs> but he said he didn't speak to his father for about a year. But I've heard him say, he's now a doctor. He said, if my father did not take me into hand, my life would have been destroyed. We are not their friends first. We are their parents. We create the boundaries so that them can glorify the Lord and come out to what he has intended them to be. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Saul and the Amalekites. I want you to hear, I want to preempt this, you know, because sometimes with this Saul, God intended Saul to be a great king. He, 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 God said, God sent Samuel to anoint Saul, and then he gave Saul three signs, and said, after these signs are, are, are um, these signs will confirm your appointment. And he said this, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully on you, and you will be changed Supernatural, listen, into another person. Once these signs are, are fulfilled, do what 
whatever your hand finds to do. Me want the Lord to say that about me, you know. Do whatever your hand finds to do. God intended Samuel Saul to be a great king. But passivity. It all came to a head. When God gave him the instruction to go and, and attack the Amalekites. God said, no, go and attack the Amalekites. Totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, dog, cat, household pets. Everything. And the challenge we have is, how did Saul respond to this command? Saul went and did the attack, you know. But it says this, Saul and the army speared Agag, and Agag was the king. And the best of the sheep, cattle, fatted calves, lambs, and everything that was good. But everything that is worthless, them destroy. You see, 90% obedience is disobedience. And, and because of passivity, according to Saul, because of influence, he is the king. The army can't do nothing unless the king approve. And the king just have to say no. And the army just do what the king says. But because of passivity, he blow it up. So Samuel, God told Samuel to go and challenge Saul. And Samuel go, went to Saul and said, Did you do what the Lord says? He said, Yes. He said, when, What is that sheep beating, bleating I hear in the background and that cow, cow mooing? Mooing. Whatever, right? Saul said this, the soldiers spared the best of the sheep to sacrifice to the Lord. But we destroyed the rest. You know, genuine. Samuel said, enough. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce, if it is in your, if in your resource, underlined pounce, on the plunder? In other words, him saying that you really take it for your own advancement. And did not obey the Lord. Does the Lord that is delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? I'm telling you something. People are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You, every time we sin, sometimes in these modern days, we, we are very articulate in 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 in, in um when call it no um when you no, it's not justified. There's a, there, anyway, but it's justified. I'll, it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. Um, in justifying our disobedience, we fancy... No, it's, no, it's, a, it's a different... It's a political term. Um, in, in, in justifying our sin. And the more articulate we are, is the better we are at it. And we make it sound like... When we're done enough, it's like we had not sinned. But God know your heart. He knew Samuel's heart. Saul's heart. Saul said, it was also sacrifice to the Lord. The only time you need a sacrifice is when you sin. So if you don't sin, you don't need no sacrifice. There is no reason to save the animal then except you wanted to have a barbecue. You wanted to nyam the man, the man le- Everybody know nyam? Yeah. Nyam is a Jamaican word, which means to eat. Everybody know what I'm saying? Out of order. Disobedience is disobedience. Can you imagine? God have planted this man in a- The man, sh- no, no, the man. God supernaturally changed his character. God set him on a course. And due to some, you know what happened to Saul? 
the kingdom was torn from his hand and from his family's hand. He became insane. And he eventually committed suicide. Now, I was telling the first service, if you did not see that in the text, you could not discern that this is what, is, what caused that to happen to him. You know? We would have just said, Lord of mercy, him salty man, look how things just go on with life with him. You see, it is a curse. Sometimes when people, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes when at a club reach some people, you know, it is a disobedience that cause certain things to reach them. When at a club come in our lives, that's why we are obedient. This is crazy. Anyway, spiritual point. Spiritual passivity can result from following the crowd. Some of us have a big call on our lives. The call is gigantic. But sometimes sick of your friend. Because we cannot stand to be alone. Because everybody else is doing it. Let me tell you a little secret. Not because bigger Christian than you is doing it. What we call bigger Christian. People who are older than you are doing it means that it's okay for you to do it. Amen. It is not an excuse. Not because everybody is doing it means that you are to do it. And some of us know it enough because we are experiencing the consequence of the crowd following. It is going to cost you something. Sometime it's going to cost your friend. Solomon. Now Solomon is like tragedy upon tragedy. You know? And Uncle JC, Ella JC mentioned it last week. But, but it's, it's, such a, it's, a, it's of such gravity that I'm mentioning it again. Solomon, the wisest man in the world. The Lord come to Solomon and in his young days when he was humble. And the Lord said, what you want? Solomon said, I have to rule these people. Give me wisdom. And God said, my goodness, what a wonderful answer. I will not only give you wisdom, but I'll give you wealth and fame as well. Him get God, the blessing of God is heavy upon Samuel. So, Solomon. It says this, in Jerusalem, Solomon made silver as common as stone. That means, you know, Everybody rich. This is like Dubai. The cash is flowing. And yet, he took 700 wives and 300 concubines from nations that were around him. Expressly, the exact thing, or one of the exact things, that God said, do not do why he became spiritually passive. He, 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 you know, uh, Uncle JC said it last week. Sometimes so much of a good thing is not good. It is, some, it is Solomon who wrote, Do not make me poor so that I can steal. And do not make me so rich that I will forget you. He wrote that. And him see one. This is like crazy stuff. But this is here for our learning. Because if it happened to them, it can happen to you. You see, spiritual passivity trumps wisdom. It trumps education. It trumps your spiritual legacy. Me, me grew up in a church, man. We know this thing. Spiritual passivity trumps all of that. He, passivity is like a cancer. It will erode everything. So the wives who used to worship other gods, after a while he allowed them to worship their gods. And then after a while they inveigled him to come and worship the gods with them. And this just lent to his demise. I want to show you the wisdom of, of Solomon. He wrote the final conclusion. After he wrote all Ecclesiastes, Solomon you know, said this. Now that all has been heard, 
Here is the conclusion of the matter. This is what life is all about. He says, fear God and keep his commands. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment. He wrote this. Including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. The man is poised for success. The man is larger than life. And, he, and this is disturbing. Not only is it disturbing because he fell, but the consequences of his fall he never experienced. Is his children experience it? And that bother me. I must tell you the truth. Right? Um, Lord, you know, that is concerning to me. <laughs> right? It says this. God said to him, since this is your attitude, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of your father David, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it from the hand of your son. What? Sometimes we are doing stuff and we are getting away with it. You know? And we are getting away with it. And we are happy, go lucky. And what we don't know is that we are piling up a curse to the generation that fell away. Because your sins co occur, are transferred to the second, third, and fourth generation. The scripture says so. So you getting away with it, but your son going to hold it, your daughter going to hold it, and your daughter is going to hold it, and your daughter's daughter is going to hold it. This is mad. Spiritual passivity can, can result from our response to a good thing. And I need to ask you what good thing you have in your life right now that is standing in the way of the Lord. The easiest one is money. Because the, depending on the way we handle money, money easily becomes a God. Sometimes when we were just coming up in the Lord and you never had much, Every time the door of the church open, you are there. Asking the Lord to bless you. The Lord bless you. And bless your good. Some of us is our education. As we grow in our education, and we be able to, to you know, put some words together in a logical sequence. When we look at the logic of the scripture, which is anti-world logic, it, it does not make sense. When I consider this, some of us is our, is our body. Him give us a good thing. The, 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 the beauty industry is a half a billion dollar industry you now. So they want you to want to look good. And there's nothing wrong with it, you know. But sometimes it overtakes. The Lord. A girl told me a story about a guy. She said the guy is an ambitious guy, man of God. She said he needed a job and he saw a job and the job was outside of his league. The job educationally required a higher level of education. And experientially required a high level of, higher level of experience. He asked the Lord for the job. The Lord said, yea, my son, I will give you the job. Lo and behold, he got the job. She said, three years later, you could not imagine that he was ever Christian. As a matter of fact, she said, he started to challenge people who were Christian. I needed to do this thing and I needed to do it now. I have to go to church. Oh, so is church paying you? You know them argument there? Yeah. Now, understand you now. Sooner or later, here man God is going to have a conversation. And 
is that is him and God conversation. They have people like Demos. Demos is in the New Testament. Demos was among a set of people. It seems that about eight or so people used to work with Paul as missionaries. He used to carry them about when he planted a church. He would leave somebody there and they would build the church and so forth. And Demos, Paul called Demos a, 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 a fellow laborer in the vineyard. So Demos looked at one time like he was a zealous man of God. But Paul says um, that in, in 2 Timothy 4, he says, Demos, because he loved this world, has deserted me. So the, the spiritual thing is that sometimes the love of the world can make you passive. I have a friend. He is in one of those Heavyweight jobs. I can't even imagine what they get as a salary. Literally. Right? But when I look at the man's lifestyle, he drives a good car, but it's not an ostentatious car. He lives in a good house, but it is not a big house. When you look at how he handles his money, he gives away a lot to charity. Him pay, I suspect that he gives more than the 10%. Do you understand? And when you look at the man's lifestyle, the man has decided that the world will not get me. I have decided no matter what I get, I am dedicated to the king and I am going to demonstrate it with my lifestyle, with my possessions. Do you realize that the reason why the Lord says to give the 10% is so that you will recognize that you need to put God first in your life? He has decided that he's going to do that. Why? Because this thing will take you over. You see, the thing about it is that he has made a choice. What is the choice you have to make? He has made a choice. And the choice is a difficult choice because it is going to cost you something. What is the choice that you have to make? God has not called us to passivity. He has anointed us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ has given us a, a power over the enemy. We need to be active. And spiritual passivity never ends in God's best. God ordained you. No, I know that I'm not talking to everybody in the room. You know. That's the truth. Some of us are, are doing what you're supposed to do. We are <clears throat> on target. We are pressing. But if you hear the voice of the Lord, God's starting to talk to you on the inside. You know that I'm talking to you. You know that the Lord is talking to you. That I'm just proclaiming what the Lord has said. So the Spirit of the Lord is saying, some of you need to just make some choices. Some of us need to choose obedience. We're getting convicted. We know it. As a matter of fact, we, before we came here, we knew we were convicted. There are some things that are outside of what God is saying. Repent now. Be like David. Just the Lord and recognize that I am the one who is out of work. Choose obedience. Just say, God, help. I need to turn. Help me, God. I want to come back to you. Some of us know that we are experiencing the consequence of some of our sin. We know it. God has already started talking to us. 
where I was, there was a man who got baptized. He said he was, he was doing extremely well. The impression you get is that he started a relationship that he knew the Lord was not pleased with. It was good for a little while, you know. But after a while, the Lord started speaking to him. And he never listened. Until the Lord took the job from him. And this is his testimony. He said, in the inside, he said, it's as if the Lord is saying, I love you too much to allow you to destroy yourself. I need to get your attention. This is his testimony, not me. What is the choice you have to make? What do you need to start that you have not started? The scripture says, repent and be baptized. So if you have repented, if you have accepted Jesus, and you're not baptized, get baptized. There's one after this service. And there's going to be one week after next. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Do the thing. If I need to start reading my Bible, start to read it. If reading is not your thing, start to listen it because faith comes by. Get a CD. You mean I'm not trying to throw no yoke on anybody, but, but, but God wants you to move. What is it that you need to stop doing? Stop making other people call the shots. Stop make other people determine what you do. Number two, choose to grow. It is not enough so to get saved and stay there. Some of us have been in here for, in, the, in Christendom for a thousand years. Okay? That does not matter. We need to grow. We need to proceed from where we are. The scripture says, continue to work out your salvation. That is why we have life groups. We provide you with a lot of opportunities for a lot of different types of growing. And this one in particular, I feel as if it's going to reach somebody exactly where they are at. Because some of the reasons why we are passive is because we don't understand that there is purpose to our lives. There's purpose that God has set you here for. And because of that, you start on us floating along. Get involved, man. Join a life group. Look here. You need to know why you are born, what you are born for. And this, I believe, will revolutionize your life. So if you want to join a life group on your back of your connection card, there's a spot that says, I will join a life group, or I want to join a life group, or something to that. Number three, choose to serve. Serving is a part of your growth. Serving in the local church or in some organization that serves people. Serve. Serving, you cannot grow in the Lord unless you serve other people. It's just a raw truth. It, God designed it to be. You are called to make a difference. You are a kingdom builder. That is how God set it up. He has anointed you for the task. You need to start to exercise those muscles. You know, Albert Schweizner says this. The only really happy people are those who have learned to serve. Number four. Some of us just need to choose Jesus. Spiritual passivity does not have to only do with Christians. It has sometimes to do with people who are not Christian. And how we are passive sometimes is that we are around the church. Hear me. We love you, you know. And we're not trying to push you away. We love that you are around church. But being around church is not enough. You're not even, no, let me not even go there. Being around church is not enough. You need to commit to Jesus. You're doing a good work, you know, but your good works is not enough. 
You may be giving money to the church, but your money is not enough. You, you, we don't understand. God set it enough for us to come back into a relationship with him. The relationship that, that mankind had with God because of Adam was, is broken. And that broken relationship puts us in jeopardy to be controlled by the enemy and killed by him. If you enter eternity without having Jesus in your heart, you're salt. The scripture says, for God so loved the world. I want to understand, it is not that God is angry with you. It is not that God vexed with you. It is not God don't want, it's not about that. The, 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 the motivation of the king is that he loves you. And I, so I find it difficult to explain how God loves you. This morning I was preparing for this and I spent about half an hour as a ball before the Lord. When I started to contemplate the love of my God for me. God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The demonstration of the love is the sacrifice of Jesus. This morning I looked on the internet, Facebook. The Bulgari Veyron, the new one. Is selling for 5.8 million US dollars. The value of an object is determined by the price you pay for the object. If the king of glory gave his best price for you, how much value do you have? How much value? God so loved the world that like he gave his son. There's no other sacrifice that can, sacri that, that can satisfy what God needs. So he himself gave himself his son. That he, so none should perish. If you stay where you are, you are already perishing by doing nothing at all. By remaining passive, you're already on the perishing list. Can you hear that? But you don't have to be. He did it so you can have eternal life. You can come into the kingdom of God. Get start experiencing eternal life now and to eternity. Can you hear that? Understand me. Your spirit will always be alive. Whether or not you are alive in hell with the enemy or you are alive with God. So when it says he give you eternal life, he makes that dead spirit alive so you can live with him. But other than that, you're going to live for it somewhere else. And that, can I hear that? Let's stand. Hi again. I hope that today's message was an inspiration to you. My prayer for you is that you would experience God's best in your life. If today you made a decision to trust Jesus for the first time, I encourage you to get involved in a local Bible-believing church. Also, you may drop us a line at info at hetransforms.me and I'll send you our book, First Steps for the New Believer. If you're in the Kingston and Metropolitan area, feel free to join us on Sundays at TLC. You can check our website for further details. God bless you. Real good. Have a wonderful day.